Hello, Advad. I'm so excited to have you here on Rendering Unconscious. Thank you for being here. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure, really. So, um, dang. You want me to jump into the reading or? Yeah. As I've been telling everyone, this is my favorite book of 2023. I actually sent this book out to a lot of people as Yule gifts, Christmas gifts. Um, nice. And yeah, it's such a good book. And like, yeah, like we talked about, I think it would be great for you to start with a reading so people can get a sense of the book and then we can chat about it afterwards. Okay. All right. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Let's do it. I might even jump around, you know. Totally fine. Just Wonderful. Throughout the book. No, no. I feel like there's like um, a lot of different like kinds of potency, like within like, I don't know the three stories so I, I you know i want to give a good taste a good sample you know what i mean wonderful all right the house is a small white colonial on the end of midtown suburban street it is placed on a plot of astroturf she crunches it with her black baby doll shoes and Anbot fo follows behind her where she unlatches the door you can tell why she had chosen the bed set she did since her furniture and walls were painted white ages ago and chipped like the new sets prized to replicate. On the beige upholstered whitewashed chair in front of them in the foyer, a crust is noticeable in the folds of the swirled Georgian armrests. Adba can spy it, peering down a foot away. He could see that this is an odd crust that developed in the corners of the and ridges of all the folds in the room, a bodily crust. Where will you put your current bedroom furniture when the other arrives? If you need to make an appointment to haul it away, I can help you with that. Yes, come into the bedroom, she breathes. Her furniture in the bedroom is old, bleach ash wood, most, more expensive than the set she had purchased, though worn. Her mattress is covered with coral pink sheets and comforter, with white flowers speckling the fabric. He can see the grass brown crust in the Vitruvian waves of the bed frame. It has to be flying airborne. He rubs his thumb and the index finger together and can feel a slight grain. How's the air filtration in this place? He asks cautiously. She's silent for a moment and then asks, What's that? You know, the vents, the air conditioning. Does it get too hot in here or do you have a problem with dust? That might be affecting the veneer on your furniture. I wouldn't want you to have to use your protection plan right away if the damage is preventable. I haven't noticed any problems she says in a spatial tone while she's about to float out of the room. Advat, feel my mattress, she commands of him, pressing her ass against the mattress. He sits down on it beside her, and it springs up, an old internal coil pillow top. Yep, you made the right call today on the new mattress. What do you sleep on, she asked. Oh, I sleep on a firm foam top. The gel and the foam, it reminds me of skin. She nearly whispered. Do you like skin? He tested. I know a lot about it, she spoke. What do you know about it? He asked cautiously. Take off your shirt, she whispered. Advat removed his black button down. He showed her his pale, unimpressive torso and his upper rib cage exposed and his nipples discolored with baby pink, red and white hues, a small slab of fat on his stomach. He lays down on the bed while his arms sprawling out. He can guess where this is going. An interesting epidermis. You are a fast flaker. Your dermis is a bit stiff. You could use a salt soak, she tells him, and she takes her moist hand and fingers the stomach. What happened to your nails? He asks quietly, feeling her fingers caress her, his stomach, folding on the tops. When they try to grow, they just blow away, she whispers. What about your skin? What kind of skin do you have? He leads. She unties her bow and lifts her dress, revealing her stomach, thighs, bra, and panties. Her skin below the neckline is pink and agitated. She unbuttons the white lace bra, and he can see her tits, two handfuls with cream-colored nipples and the pink agitation all along the mounds. White capillary roots strike through the patterns of agitation. Can I ask what it is? He whispered to sound sensitive. She touches her chest with her embryonic fingers and finds a crease, lightly tugs on it, and a thin mask of skin lifts like a cobweb from her neck down to her tits and under her belly button. 
holds on by her white rayon panties. She snaps the skin out from under the crease of her panties, and it blows from her hand like a flag made of gray matter. It's sensitive. I've had reconstruction on my face, legs, and arms. It's hard to have the procedure around my major organs. It's a kind of PSS, peeling skin syndrome, she explained, her hairless green eyes wide open and her blocks of lips mashing against each other, hiding her teeth. Do you show many people? I saw you in your true form. I was, I was sleeping earlier today. I have wanted to stay with you to stay with me since. Will you stay with me? I can stay with you tonight, Amber Grease. But do you think I'm too ugly? I think you're stunning. Oddbot hadn't had time to reflect on what he felt, however, he remembered their car ride. He paused, looking for his words. Amber Grease, your taste is ethereal. She inched toward him until her bare stomach touched his own. She felt lukewarm, too soft, and too fragile. What's, what is my, what is my true form? He asked softly. You're a big wabbit. And what are you? I'm a snake. Are you going to gobble me up? He smiles. I am one. I really will. She fumbles herself around so that her head is in his groin, her skin burning and flicking with the maneuver. She gnaws on the ridge of his pants until she unlatches them. Agba can feel her warm tongue on his slight erection. It feels huge, like a cow's tongue. It's complete, contains all his experience. He breaks from the feeling for a moment to slide his finger under her panties, pulling them to the side and in front of his face. He sees her vulva, apple red. Agba's thoughts were the surge, and the surge is the visual experience of her rare red lips and oral stimulation. It is the last thing he can remember, the vagina in his dreams. The first thing he has in his mind as the sun beats down on his eyelids. The red delicious. It is the red of the flip side of his lids. As he opens them, he wakes up on a plot of grass near the highway. The gray of it and the roar of the cars passing. At first, he's thinking that he's in a park and he's completely confused. He realizes there are units, apartments all around him. It isn't anywhere near Amber Grace's house. He's feeling hurt that he's not with her. He's got a message on his phone from his boss asking where he was and where Philip is. How should I know where Philip is, he thinks. He calls her to put his two weeks notice in like a good boy. You and Philip were supposed to be here this morning, she strains with a voice that sounds like lace. Look, Paula, I don't know about Philip, and I've had a personal development, and I had to give you my two weeks. Well, I thought you might be together. But now you're telling me you want to quit? Can my day get any worse? I'm sure he will sure show up. He's committed to the company. Yeah, nice knowing you. She drops a call and Oddbat is left with an empty, lonely feeling. He starts walking to what he thinks is the exit in the small labyrinth of a dog park and low-income apartments. He's trying to recount where Ambergris lives. He hasn't felt lonely for years. He sees a job posting for a groundskeeping position at the window of a front office and snags it. He walks down the street and thinking up the red pussy like a visual mantra, walk, walking towards the heat of the sun. That's so that good. job. <laughs> it's so fun to hear you read it and do, and do the voices. And, and Amber Grace, what a character. Oh my God, I love it. <laughs> yeah, that's... That's probably my favorite part, too. I cannot. So, yeah, I don't know. Do you want me to read any more? Or do you want to do something else? Maybe read a little of the others. Yeah, there's one that I I read at this Portland erotica night. And I, I don't know. I really like it. It's that little short chapter called Elizabeth. I'm going to find it. Okay. I like it. It's like one of the only chapters that is like, more from i don't know like a woman's perspective if i could have one you know so yeah let's see yeah no it's such a good book how you have all these different kind of narratives and how they come together i won't give any spoilers but it's so good it's such a rich book and you're such a great writer the way you describe everything is so beautiful thank you okay let's see okay here it is all right i'll do this one All right, this is Elizabeth, page 67. His face has the essence of softened butter, 
his eyes sinking like beaded toasted raisins with two black arched eyebrows mounting his girdly complexion. His lips are sylph and point like a crown. He must only be five foot four to five foot six, and yet he still has sex appeal, as his body is nymph and playful, completely unthreatening, and so I'm intrigued by his mind. I want to fuck his soft body bare naked, trapped inside a bundle of Peruvian like Vachuna wool comforter, malleable milk bread. I'm dozing into this fantasy as I watch him talk with Mark on the topic of feminism and masking, and heaven knows feminism, he needs it, otherwise his existence trampled by brutes. You see, I imagine him centered in a noble bed, a nest with rosewater sheets. As I walk into the room, one hand pressed onto the knob and another cradling a blood orange semolina cake made with chamomile syrup. I see him there like a flower bud, his adult body like a fetus in a dollhouse, and itty bitty baby, a clit, balled up with his fingers and his mouth. He looks like his paintings, doesn't he? A globular form, the skin melting off his scaffolding like cookies and like glue under the sun. Clit, the room around him is made up of, of, in pinks, from the gloss hot pink floors to the cream pink walls. I brace my heels, trading soft as I can muster, or treading soft as I can muster as to not wake him. My legs are bare and milky white, and they are pink at my knee, and you can see my green veins heavy underneath. My sh skirt is short, salmon tight, a set to my sports jacket, and my white tank top holds my enormous natural breasts. By this fallacy, I mean my massive implants, but you can see the whole outline of insane circles. Above them rest my skinny neck and puffy lips, made like a cushion and painted hot. Yes, I am a semi-conscious blonde with black ringed lash smudge slits to peer out of. My tote bag reads, proud bimbo. Mommy bimbo is here, my sleeping dream. dream. She's going to cut you a big piece of pie and you can eat it right in your bed with mommy feeding it into your delicate mouth. Sweet comfort and a sweet paradise for him. And when he wakes so belligerently while mute, he looks as though he has been trapped in discord, a nightmare, and I know that I am the one extending sweet peace after steady torment. I love you, little Ebony. I'd let you lay my body down and contort in whichever way as my flesh, synthetic sculpture. Don't you want to play with your dolly, my baby boy? I love you in my void, and I will protect you, sm you sweet Ebony. I'm sitting on the foot of the bed, reaching my hand to his mouth, feeding him bites of blood orange cake with my bare fingers. And when he takes a bite, my fingertips pass through his lips only slightly, as if he can't simply help himself. He's eating slowly and thoughtfully, and when he can't take another bite, he lays his head in my lap. I hand him his water to wash it down. I can feel him exhale on the crest of my vulva through the thin layer of polyester. He's a certain kind of foal when after you eat, your heart begins to beat spe speedily. He's restless and his arms wrap all around my back and he's pretending to fall asleep when I tuck my blouse under the base of my tits. To be him, peering up slightly at the mountainous breasts, their outlines creating a horizon inside of the vagina room. He slowly lifts his head, fragile, destitute, and graces his lips onto my right nipple, swollen, rose water, green veined. He's circling the tip of his tongue around my areola. He's sitting behind me on the memory foam bed, and he's brushing my hair with a round-headed brush. It's long, yellow cream, and cut into a straight line on the edge of my back. You are the prettiest one I have, he'd say, as he kisses me softly on the cheek. I'm a bit different than the, his other dolls. All of my plastic is under the skin. Look who it is, a figure hanging behind the door like a shy cat. That is what I'm talking about. Encapsulated in a rubber shell, operating on a shred of sexual confidence. Her synthetic hair looks hard and knotted. Her existence is begging for help and validation. The only thing you can see is her eyes, and even they want to hide. Ebony jumps up, skips toward the lurker, and wraps his arms around hers in embrace. Her head reaches his chest. She's probably tearing up under there. She might be a man, but I'm not one to judge. It doesn't matter who's inside. Her outside is her inside. It's, she's so thoughtfully arranged her mask to reflect the persona inside of her. 
appearance. This is the alchemy of appearance. She must feel so light as he worships her mask. He kisses her down to her cartoonish breasts. It's not that she needs him, but she does need an audience. This man is a devoted fan. He leads her bitty hand to the bed where I'm watching, and he sits her at my side. We sit like a hill and a mountain. Ebony asks, will you two let me orchestrate something here? We nod, and he handles the masker by her knotted, ringleted, synthetic auburn hair at the nape of her neck, and with his other hand feels my skull back under my soft, blown-out hair and presses our faces together. Myself on a downward trajectory and her looking up until our mouths are pressing together. I kiss her and I can feel her stick out the tip of her tongue from the mouth slit of her mask. She's holding our heads. He's holding our heads with measured control. There's a tea table in the corner of my fantasy suite. He leads her and me by our hands to sit comfortably. He pours a milky tea, a London fog with honey and lavender. The napkins have the slight scent of patchouli. The teacups with the frothy Earl Grey are accented on their rims with pink and gold roses. I lower my eyes to the masker who sips her tea through a paper straw. I say, how lovely that we all get to share this afternoon. He is pumping his cock like an automaton as he stands over the tea table where we sip. The facade peels off like a gel film, and I'm awake to his adulthood. He is the doll man himself, his body undulated and naked, his brow line furious and muscles stiff with concentration. He is direct and sinister, old as the old world, primeval thoughts that float up and the pop into action. He is lizard-brained, Californian, and when his soul returns after death, it will laugh. His sperm coughs out of his penis into the teacup, and he handles it as to rub the tip around the rim, wiping it all into the cup. He tucks himself back into his shorts and sits back into the chair with an attentive look in his eyes, his brows lifted in sympathy and his facial expression awash with innocence. He takes the teaspoon and absentmindedly twirls it into the sperm. I love him so much. I sit up and embrace his head and my breasts from behind him, his neck saddled between. I massage his shoulders, then he's swaying with my touch. I love you, Ebony. I, I love you too, Eliza. His voice is hollow, firm, and youthful, restricted airflow. My voice is measured. I have a large, decadent woman's voice. Lodeline sits there watching. She doesn't attempt, she doesn't attempt much deprived of something. Uh, she doesn't attempt much deprived of someone's direction because she's neurodivergent in this way. Her voice is a strain, and I told her not to talk or to talk around me. So she watches as I molest him in the chair, my arms wrapping around his waist. You know what? He sighs. Let's go out. Let's go outside. It's the hot spring. A sparkling fly drifts near my nose while I hold his hand while he holds her hand, walking down the courtyard on a cobble steps out of the downtown apartment. We look like three fingers. Ebony is the ring. We find shade under the resident weeping willow. I remove my clothes and feel the hot grass on my skin as I lay. Lodeline sits the trunk of the tree sweating inside of the plastic. She sipped iced coffee from a straw that leads through her mask. Little babies have no fun. Ebony draws my outline with charcoal, and I feel as though I'm gazing at him through pressure. My eyes are pierced and my brow furrowed my lips curling to hold my cheeks like wild apples. My nipples grow erect and feel the grass. Goose goosebumps form out in my outer arms, buttocks. I tell Ebony to unclothe, and he simply takes off his pants and lets his penis become firm in the grass like a little garden worm. I point my long, manicured finger and slowly trace it with the padded tip. And that's that. <laughs> nice. I love these readings because they show your great writing style but they don't give away too much of what's going on in the book yeah it's kind of like, hard to do i that know what's going on because i'm like oh yeah this is this and this but like people will have no idea <laughs> <laughs> you gotta yeah. read it yeah that's good so i have to ask how did this book come about yeah um i think i wrote this book when i was going through kind of like um like, I don't know, like some like sexual awakening or something. <laughs> I, um, 
I think I got the idea for it when I was 23 and I'm 27 now only 28 in February so I um I don't know I just you know was sort of obsessed obviously like there's in the parts I read there's like not a lot of you know sex dolls but the book has a lot of sex dolls in it and um I was just like really sort of I guess just obsessed with sex dolls and like um getting getting some sort of fulfillment out of a doll and um you know I spent like probably hours and hours like looking at dolls because there's I mean like it's a bigger in, like industry than most people probably would think <laughs> like looking at dolls and you know like even like researching it I wrote like a philosophy paper when I was getting my undergrad on on sex dolls and like the use of sex dolls and um I um I don't know I guess I feel like um when most most people think of sex dolls as like um a sort of just like they look at sex dolls and they just like think it's like filth and I guess I when I see sex dolls I just think of all the different possibilities that I can you know achieve with them especially you know art and um even meditation and you know magic and um I don't know it just you know on some level it's almost a magical tool and on another level it is just like a filth thing <laughs> and like yeah I um I'm just it's kind of like scary to get into that sort of thing because like it's not you know really accepted by like most people you know in polite society if you will but um <laughs> it's it's uh it's yet. also super because of <laughs> yeah yet <laughs> no I think it's really like I was gonna say ahead of its time but it's like right at its time I feel like like ahead of the time but like kind of like like I said like when like when Burroughs Queer came out you know this is a whole like this is underground you know and and he wasn't popular right away you know he was he was you know cutting edge and of course there was tons of queer people and tons of people doing what he was doing but it wasn't talked about in polite society as you said right and now of right. course it's like yeah Burroughs is everywhere Burroughs is you know Burroughs and you know queer people hopefully are accepted everywhere not yet but you know it's getting there it's more mainstream and it's just like this is human sexuality like yeah get yeah. with it and I think like <laughs> sex dolls is like uh like as we've talked about art artificial human companions was something that Anton LaVey talked about and he talked yeah. about that in like the 60s definitely taboo then still taboo yeah. right but like yeah. you know there's definitely something with it and I feel like with the way psychoanalysis is going and like understanding human psychology and sexuality and like how we do have this kind of relation to the other and how you can use the dolls in this way you know in self-development it's all like to me it all makes perfect sense mm. and then it can yeah. also just be filth and fun if you aren't <laughs> yeah like i i can take it to you know many different places and i think that's why i like most about it um and i think it's like amazing that like you know i mean really the only reference that i have for you know people that were talking about it in the 60s is anton levey and like he um like i really do regard him as like uh innovator and like this sort of like art like artistic and also like psychological inno innovator you know so yeah um and you know i'm really interested in like what i don't know if there is it like any um therapeutical or therapeutical the there like uh therapeutic like you know service that dolls could employ people you know i hope that that's like it gets researched more because there isn't really a lot of research on that you know and um yeah, I um I would I would love to know more about that. So Yeah, and I think it absolutely does fulfill that function or could because it's like you can be with somebody that's not with no judgment, you know, you don't have to be afraid of like how the other person is going to feel, what they're gonna think about what you wanna do, you know? You can like maybe really express yourself more fully or learn to through like interacting yeah. with the dolls. I mean, especially I don't know, like and this is like sort of like is coming from a person that is like you know not a scientist <laughs> but um 
I, uh, you know, it's like, especially you know, I had friends that identify as incels, you know, I, I know people that have a lot of trouble with human intimacy. And even when they're offered it, they just, they just don't know how to give it. And um, I think that it's helpful for people, maybe it might be to practice that with um, something with a human likeness. So, yeah. Totally. I think eventually it's going to be like great. Blade Runner 2049. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And have you, in your research, did you find any other books like this? Because I have never read a book like this. Um. Oh, like Spiral of Objects? I mean, no. Um. No, yeah. I, I, like, I know that there's more movies. Like, I've never, I'm, like, feel really ashamed that I've never seen, like, Lars and the Real Girl or, like, because that's been recommended to me, like, a dozen times. Um. I just like for some reason never end up watching it, but um, I I know that there's more like ci cinema. I think that's like easier to to dig up about sex dolls and mm. books. But uh, yeah, if I mean if if you find them, I'd love to know about them. I'll let <laughs> so. you know. I know Werner Herzog did the did one uh about dolls in Japan and people marrying their dolls and like a whole doll yeah. culture. Yeah, yeah, I think, and it's funny because I I think um you know, whatever it is about Japanese culture that like welcomes that thing a little bit more, like definitely, you know, prevalent over there and more accepted. Um, I don't know, to like be more playful, I guess. So yeah, it's interesting. Did I ever tell you about the guy I met when I went to New Orleans? No. No. So <laughs> I was in New Orleans and um visiting a friend and I think my friend was at work so I did what you do in New Orleans which is went to the bar <laughs> it was like noon noon o'clock bar you know yeah. and you know the great old like New Orleans bars and I was having something like a mint julep or something being in the whole scene and this guy sitting next to me in this like super cute suit like very like you know kind of antique looking with his like little hat and little bow tie and everything yeah. and like <laughs> and then we started chatting and then he's like oh you should come over and I was like okay and he had a whole family of dolls oh my god <laughs> he had like no. yeah he had like five dolls <laughs> wow. including little dolls awesome. <laughs> yeah it was you like know, a whole family good. of dolls and this was like I think it was 2015 we must have been somewhere around there. And uh, and I was just like, whoa, what is this? This is amazing. This is like little <laughs> cute, unassuming guy that lives with his family of dolls. And this is what he does. And I was like, yeah, why not? Oh, man. Dude, I think there's going to be more and more of this as time goes on. Yeah. If someone doesn't marry me soon, that's going to be me. <laughs> completely honest with you. <laughs> Your family of dolls. I hope yeah. if I go to New Orleans again, I can find him. It's amazing. I would actually <laughs> love to meet more people that are like, you know, have dolls and like have a relationship with dolls. You know, I guess it would make me feel a little bit more like, um, I guess like less insular and like it. It would just be nice, you know. I've I've only heard I've only heard rumors about a couple people in Portland that do so. Yeah, well, I think the more people read your book, the more people might become interested in having dolls of their own. And I, mm -hmm. I certainly was. I read it and I was like, I'm going to have to get me a doll one day. <laughs> yeah, well, it's hard, too, because, I mean, dolls are expensive, like are. sex dolls, especially like, I mean, a really nice one is like six grand. And the one that I have, Nubalena, she's like she was like a thousand dollars. But like for me, you know, that was a big purchase. And she's like considered a, a cheapie, you know what I mean? So it's like, you it's an investment for those sex dolls. I almost am kind of at the point now where I'm like, I need to figure out how I'm going to make my own kind of dolls, like larger dolls. So that's that's what I've been thinking about recently. That's what LeVay did. He made his dolls and he had a, a den of iniquity in the basement of his house. That was his house was an old like speakeasy from, you know, when prohibition was happening. So you could get mm -hmm. to the bar, the basement through the fireplace. You like went in through the fireplace mm -hmm. and went down into a mm -hmm. secret bar. And he had the, yeah, it's awesome. And he had in the bar, he called it the den of iniquity. And he just always yeah. had his dolls set up there, like hanging out. And that's where his dolls like lived and hang out. So he'd go down there and like party with his dolls. And he had one girl who was like one doll that had like peed herself because that was like a kink of his. That's so the she one would... that I read about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So she'd be like sitting in her pee or whatever because he liked that. I wonder what he, <laughs> what he used for the pee. 
Good question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he did that. So he was really ahead of his time and I like it. And I think it is great. Like, I love his idea of a total environment and like, you know, create the world you want to live in, you know, just create it. So if you want to like have a den of iniquity, have your bar in your house with like all your friends that you hang out with there when you want to, you know, do it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think um, that's the other reason why LeVay is so inspiring to me is just because he um, was high, like kind of hyper focused on curating his environment and like people don't really understand that about him like if i say like oh like i'm into learning about levee like most people around me like just think it it's like the i don't know like satanic like empowerment thing and i'm kind of more at just like i admire him as uh, someone that really took control of his life and like made every part of his like living situation like something he enjoyed you know like I love that he had a purple parlor. Like I would love to have a purple room in my cl- my house. So <laughs> totally, he had a, pro- a projector. He had the projector in another room so that the movie could be projected through the wall, like a hole in the wall. But he wouldn't have to hear the projector. It was like in the room next door. He had it set yeah. up nice. Yeah, and I totally think of that when we're like arranging our house. It's like we're we're having like different rooms for different things and it's becoming like that more and more the longer we live here. And I think that's such a great thing to take away. It's like, uh, yeah, the empowerment is great, but this is part of empowerment. It's like, okay, Mm -hmm. you know, the world doesn't necessarily provide us with things that we like or enjoy. Like, I don't like most of what's going on in pop culture generally my whole life. So you have to like make it yourself, you know, and surround yourself with it and live in your own little bubble. And then of course, Mm -hmm. like be aware of what's happening in the world or whatever. But when you're home, you know, why not have your own little oasis? Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's And it's just, you know, and I, I think a lot of that satanic philosophy too, is just like how to get to that point where you can do that. You can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. I like Mm -hmm. that. It's a good point. Yeah, Carl and I think about that a lot. Like, I'm just so happy that I can work online and live in the middle of nowhere, you know, because five years ago, I didn't know that was an option, you know? Somehow it's like, we're just like trying to figure out how to make it work as you move along. And yeah, Yeah. it's great that we live in a time where we could do things like that. I, um, I mostly grew up in different like towns that were like out in the sticks and um so like I always like wanted to live in a city because like my parents like kept me like in the hills like <laughs> on, like sometimes it was like lakeside so it's kind of nice but like you know like always like way out there and um yeah I recently went back to the like Spokane Washington it's like place where I was born and like spent a lot of time in the countryside and was just like oh man like as long as you like just gather like a cool like I don't know people that visit you and like celebrate with you and like have festivities with you out in the countryside like it's such a dream like so much more fun almost than like I don't know just meeting randos and bars at cities so that's what I've been thinking I'm um I I'm really sort of getting inspired Spiral of Objects kind of mentions this about Spokane but I'm going down this rabbit hole of like midwestern cults and and like the rumors about them and stuff and some of it's like kind of like satanic panic bogus and things like that but it's also interesting like there's so many weirdos that like hide up in Spokane and Idaho and you know all those places so that's what I've been researching lately interesting are you gonna write another book yeah I um oh (laughs) there's a uh, boats out there i i actually did write another book that um a, a very small japanese publisher has is the one that i was writing in france um and i mean when i say very small i don't know how big it is it's like you know one of those publishers that i'm like you look really cool you have like really interesting you know um books out and you know you're based in japan so i'm just gonna you know trust it and give it to you um and the guy that runs it is like really cool is i i actually like you know was sort of connected to him like through chapart 
Um, and he's he's planning to publish that in the spring. So if, you know, good. Oh, good is it new to... coil? What was that? Is it new coil? It's a uh, posthuman magazine. Posthuman Ooh, magazine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you know them Ooh. with Kenji. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and like I um I don't know because um I think I mainly found them because like you know Tom Bland's. We started talking on Instagram, and I only know him through you, so that's why. Yeah, I made, I made Tom buy your book, because I was like, Tom, you're going to yeah. love this book. <laughs> yeah, that's what he said. That's I, And I only posted through that. I because, am your biggest like, fan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, and I, I, like, love talking to Tom now, by the way. Good. I love that. Yeah, I yeah, know. It's really, like so nice that like trip Hard is like connected to me there are like more people that i don't know like to read <laughs> so yeah it's hard to find sometimes <laughs> mm -hmm. well you know it's a laborious task and like my closest friends have never read my work so and like i don't sometimes i just don't even really want to ask them because i don't know it's just it it's a it's a kind of a it's not like looking at a picture you know so yeah yeah, well, they should. I don't think my friends read my work either. So. <laughs> I'm like, does anyone read this? I don't know. Someone does out there. <laughs> right. I know. Yeah. So like, we're, now that we're I'm pretty actually... esoteric. We're like niche, 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 niche. <laughs> yeah. There I are know. many niches piled, piled on top of each other. <laughs> Psychoanalytic, satanic, sexual, <laughs> doll, <Yeah>. kink. <laughs> right yeah i know i know and i'm like uh oh, you know i feel like the only people that like me you know are perverts but it's, that's, i'm happy but those with are my that. favorite people yeah exactly exactly i'm glad that we, we can stay connected that just means they're really in touch with themselves right yeah I'll take it from I'll take it from you. You're the doctor. You know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. My other favorite. I read a lot of books because of the podcast, and I always want to, you know, familiarize myself with people's work before they come on. And I read so many good books in 2023, and a couple psychoanalytic ones that I recommend because I know you have like a reading group. Um, yeah. Abdi yeah. Sekatapulu, if you haven't read her work, she's amazing. And she made two books last year. One is called uh, Sexuality Beyond Consent. And the other one she did with her partner, Anne Pellegrini, and it's called Gender Without Identity. And they're both excellent. And she also okay. bought your book because I was like, you have to buy this book. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, Gender Without Identity sounds really interesting. I mean, just the title itself, I'm I'm curious. So, yeah, I I do want to read that. You know, and in like it's um especially like in you know in in my reading group and in Portland we we've, we've read you know um I don't know ideas that aren't necessarily like um we've read both we've read you know a lot of there's a lot of ideas around surrounding gender so um we're we're interested in seeing the possibilities so I I I want to know the theory yeah absolutely. That's why I like her book. She like expands the discourse. I feel like the discourse mm. has gotten into like a a little narrower run and she like blows it open. It's like more yeah, to the no, like so. things can be malleable, you know, there can be a yeah. lot of malleability in in, in people. Yeah, you don't have to pick like. and then like be like, This is me forever. Yeah, right. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know, yeah, because yeah, you know, I um yeah, I Identity is one of those words that is going to confuse me endlessly. So, <laughs> absolute. And I also have your artwork up in our in our rose room, our pink room, which is where I like to spend a lot of time reading. So Nuva's nice. there. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, you know, if anyone wants prints of Nuvalina, I have a closet full of them that I can't do anything with because. <laughs> yeah how do people get yeah. in touch with you if they do want something <laughs> um probably i think instagram is probably like the main source of social media that i use so it's just at ad underscore vat um at ad underscore vat um so that would be yeah that's pretty much it and then i can send people like my email from there um yeah very cool 
So what are you up to now or next? We're going to do an event at Morbid Anatomy later this year to be announced. Well, I guess I'll have to do that. Yeah, I'll have to do that. I'm like, not, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't have too many plans for the future. I would love to do some more like traveling and writing, but yeah. I'm also kind of like, you know, stuck here like working and you know just like trying to make a living and everything so we'll see i am definitely like writing um i'm sort of in a pre-writing phase right now and i'm excited to like send you whatever um post human magazine puts out to uh yeah that'll be great and i'm excited for you to read my things happen book you've gotten a little taste I know, no, I really, 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 really like that book. <laughs> like, so I really like it. Yeah, I, um, I don't know. I just think it has like such a nice rhythm to it. So that's probably the first thing I would bring up. It's just like, it just reads so, I don't know, like naturally, even though it's, it's like a cut up novel. So like, you wouldn't think that would happen, but yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly good. well what i learned with cut up long form novel is that you have to like finesse it a little bit because if you leave it pure cut up it's just like stress so it's yeah. like i cut it up and then i was like okay i have to like smooth it out a little bit to make it actually readable you know? yeah <laughs> so like if yeah. sentences like like sometimes you'll see like different sentences don't really like these ideas don't really go together how does this paragraph work it's because they were like cut ups and then i like made them into sentences that would work as a like grammatically correct sentence mm -hmm. so that's what that's what i ended up doing which also burroughs yeah. did too so it's okay <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah you can't like um, torture people <laughs> right yeah yeah when i when i was doing cut up poetry um when i was like doing that like writer's residency i I mean, that was so fun. I would love to. I'm definitely going to do that again. And I did like put it in the work that I was working on. But I I just sort of like really um, like put it in as chunks of poetry instead of like writing like in novel form. Um, but I don't know. It still worked. Like I kind of considered it like more of an incantation than anything else. Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, getting all those words together. So yeah they and are like the rhythm of it mm -hmm. yeah like an incantation yeah so um yeah I don't know I I love that and I also want to tell you that um I have like this like signed copy of Cities of the Red Light which is one of my favorite Burroughs book mm -hmm. and it says like to the mod man on it like nice. that's what he wrote and I'm like to the mod man like means like me in the future yeah <laughs> <laughs> it came to you <laughs> yeah yeah. I love that. Mm -hmm. No, cut ups are totally magical. And yeah, I read I finished the final edits today actually. So now it's gonna be ready to go soon. I know. So when you, when is it gonna come out? Soon. I would say in a few weeks or a month or so. Okay, hell yeah. So it's hell soon. yeah. Well I'll definitely it's have soon to at this stage. That. Yeah. I yeah. um I'm interested in like because I I only I feel like I only read like one or two chapters, so yeah, I'm like I where does it go? I only sent you a section. I, I like, basically... tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you all my stories right now. I basically <laughs> wrote down a bunch of memories from my teens and early twenties, and then yeah, and then literally cut them up and threw them all over the house, and then picked them up at random, and then I couldn't for some reason like just do cutting and pasting in the computer like I had to do it physically and then I had to retype it all into the computer as a document I don't know why I had to do that it was torture but I did it that way <laughs> wow yeah. yeah dang so it was a process it's ba I've basically been working on it for th three years of a little over oh years. I didn't realize that I didn't realize it was like that long of an endeavor for you yeah it was a whole why thing not? I started cool. it November 2nd, 2020. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That and it's sense. also like very personal material. So it was like intense to revisit yeah. things, you know, and then be like, am I really going to tell people this? And it's like, well, if yeah. I make the character have a different name, then maybe it's yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I do the same thing. It's not really <laughs> me. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, or maybe I, I can deny I, it. It's fiction. Yeah, I, exactly. You can deny it. I tell people that I'm just smuggling, smuggling all this, like, you know, I don't know, all my flaws <laughs> and my trauma and the bad things that I've done into the, into the fiction. <laughs> that, I think that's what writers do. <laughs> <laughs> That's what artists do. That's just how it works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and but like, do you feel like, I don't know, like professionally, like being an analyst that you have to be super careful about what you put out or? I used to. Absolutely. And like uh, when I first became a psychologist, like I was on a bunch of like experimental records and things that like friends made in, in Florida and stuff like that. And I actually like made People would like say, like I say I would be in grad school, they write like, oh, Dr. Vanessa Sinclair's on this record. And then when I was actually a doctor, I was like, you have to take that off because when people Google me, that's like the first thing they find is this like music. Yeah. And now I'm making much weirder music <laughs> and just putting it out there. So it's like, yeah. uh, it was a whole process. At first I was like, no, I can't do that. I'm a doctor now. And then mm. I think really the pandemic like changed everything. Like it, it was like incremental. Oh, I didn't it was like that recent. Yeah, it's like incremental, like, first, I would say, like, encountering Jen and being with Jen kind of like outed me in a way. And then for real. Yeah. yeah. Like, you're, <laughs> like you're the like analyst friends that. were like, what's going on here? <laughs> so that was like, oh, yeah, man. I like came out, came out that Must way. Have felt like such a gangster. Like, <laughs> Yeah. And then, yeah. And then I was more open about like queerness and magic and stuff like that. And then, yeah. and then since then, yeah, that's like 10 years ago. It's just, prog I've just progressively become more myself and then uh, like outwardly. And then mm -hmm. uh, in the, during the pandemic was when I was really just like, nothing else matters in the world. What is all this bullshit posturing? Like you have to just make your art, you know? Yeah. That's all that matters. Yeah. And I like hope I really hope that someday I can be in a place where like I can just like show my face and like be naked on the internet, like whatever, you know. This um, is me. Yeah, like this is me. And like I'm I'm fine with that. But I um I don't know. Like it's just and you can cut this part out, by the way, but um just like I somehow got on this like life track where like I am teaching and like I have to deal with like a protected, you know, group of like, you know, kids. So it's like sucks <laughs> that I have to be like so sterile, like online. And I hours and hours going through like, you know, Googling my name and like erasing all the things that, you know, is like someone could, you know, really take me to the principal's office. <laughs> so, yeah. No, it's a real thing. Yeah, it's a real yeah. thing. Mm. and I think I'm able to do it too because yeah like I I not I don't work for anybody anymore and I don't have any yeah like authorizing bodies giving me permission to like be myself I basically yeah. I left all psychoanalytic institutes and organizations and I'm just like this is just the bullshit world and I wasn't in this world to like you know have people think I'm smart or tell me like oh this is okay and this isn't okay I'm doing this job to like help people with their problems yeah. you know Right, so like yeah. I'm not doing it to like be part of this like psychoanalytic group, you know? Like I don't care about yeah. that. Yeah, wow. But Oof. it was definitely a process. And I think that's important to tell people too, because I didn't like come out the gate like this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think actually yeah, psych but... going through psychoanalysis helped me be able to be more myself. Oh, really? Mm. So yeah, wow. Have you like been doing um have you been doing like talk therapy for like a number of years or something? Yeah, I did analysis for like 10 years. Like on yourself or with people? Yeah. Or like on yourself? Okay. Gotcha. With, with other cool. analysts. Yeah. I had three yeah. different analysts. Dang. Mm -hmm. I, want an, I want an analyst. <laughs> it's fun. Well, let me know someday. if you want one. Yeah, someday, someday. There's a great school I, out of San Francisco that does online. Oh, really? That mm -hmm. Yeah, that might be cool. Yeah, I, um, and I don't really know, I don't know, I guess there's, I, I guess there's some things that I might want to unlock. I'm just not really sure what I want out of it yet, so. Yeah, and also, I think 
yeah, expressing yourself through your writing and with Nuvolina is also your own kind of self analysis. Yeah, it helps. It helps. Um, yeah, I think that like expressing myself with, I don't know, there's a, there's a definitely like a therapeutic act in like being able to like sort of, this is going to sound so weird, just like dress up Nuvalina and, you know, be able to like, um, I don't know, I guess like project a part of myself on something that um, like, I don't necessarily have to like put on a dress or like, you know, do a, do a my hair or like make myself look that feminine. Um, But it, I feel like it is helpful for me to express my femininity, like doing that to Nuvalina. So um, yeah, I don't know. It's just like this weird balance that I like struck with that. (laughs) Yeah. But that's also very living. And he called it the demonic and the demonic is like, you're kind of like, counterparts where you yeah. like you can find that in another person or you can find that in yourself or you can find it with the artificial human companions where you like are able to express all these different multiple ways of being without having to like yeah be have that be your identity and go in the world right that way. yeah 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 exactly that's great so everyone needs to get smile of objects it's Perfect. not just smart <laughs> it's very psychologically rich and super tantalizing and exciting and you learn yeah. about whole realms of underground worlds that you may never have known existed but you should know and you might end up wanting your own doll at, at the end yes yes you after you read this you might end up purchasing a doll and or this is novelina on the cover we have to yeah uh, New- let everyone Nuvalina know a she's mask. a model yes yeah. I know. It's funny because it looks like a person in a mask at first. Yeah, but she's the cover star. Is there anything <laughs> else that you wanted to mention that we didn't get to? Oh gosh. Um, I I think that's about it. Like, thank you. Thank you so much for talking and you know, spending this time with me. Um I'm so excited that like, you know, you're a fan of my book and that I can talk to other people that are also like into reading and into this kind of into this kind of literature. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for being here and for doing what you do. And yeah, whenever you have something else come out or you just want to talk about something, you can always come back. Whenever you want to chat, just chat not to the public. (laughs) We can always just chat too. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Yeah, we should do that too. I know. I'm like, I've never, this is the first podcast I've ever been on. So, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Very cool. Yeah. Well, I'm happy that we did it. Yeah, me too. I popped your podcast, Cherry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> Much needed. <laughs> And sometimes I get groups of people together. Like I've had Zy Valdez and Tom Bland and Jason Hoff together. It was just like queer poets. And that was fun to chat. So sometime if you want to come on and chat with some other people just to like see what we end up talking about, it's fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that does sound fun. I, w- I would like to fun. do that. I like doing yeah. that sometimes. Exciting. Yeah, very exciting. This is just Thank the you. beginning. I'm so happy to talk to you. Yeah, I know. I know, it really feels that way. It is. There's much more to come. Cool. All right. right. Yeah, I feel like we should go to New York together and, like, I don't know. Have a book launch. I only have have one friend in New York right now that I could go stay with. Really? I'm actually, I was actually asked to give a talk at a conference in New York the first week of May. So I might actually be in New York. Oh, really? In May? Yeah, I'm and like, if you did go to New York, we ooh. could have a book lunch event there. Dang. Well, I'm try I'm definitely trying to go to New York to see this particular friend. And I've been sort of making loose plans to do this forever. Um, so with wait, when did you say you were going? May? It would be the first week of May. My com- the conference okay. is the eighth through the tenth. So I could okay. come before or stay a little bit after or whatever. But okay. I'm sure we could especially with Jason's help get get an event set up at like the bureau or something yeah I would definitely yeah I mean especially if I start planning now for that I could probably do that so I'll yeah I'll 
I'll th- I'll I'll get back to you on that. That'd yeah. be awesome. We, we have totally planted seeds in the ether. Yeah. Yeah. To see what may grow. Okay. Perfect. All right. So we'll talk again soon. All right. Yeah. I'll talk to you soon, Vanessa. Bye, see you.